Hello, and welcome to today's Data Byte, where we're going to talk about organizing data to be able to explore it and graph it and make sense of it. So we'll think about wide versus tidy or long organization of our data. What does that mean? How does it influence what we can do with our data? And some other things to consider when we're organizing our data. But I encourage you before we dive in to stop for a second and pause and think for yourself. What are your green, yellow, and red lights when it comes to organizing data? So what things are easy for you when it comes to organizing data? What things slow you down? What questions do you have about how or why we should organize data? And what are the things that just stop you in your tracks when you try to organize data? So stop the video, think to yourself, drop some comments below, whichever you'd prefer, and then come on back and keep going forward with, with the video. So obviously when it comes to organizing data, we are fully in the organized section of our data literacy pieces. But what does that mean more broadly, right? We've got these three realms where we get our data, we explore the data, and we infer meaning from data. Well, we're sitting in the sort of organizing and processing steps so that we can do all those other pieces, so that we can explore it and infer meaning from it, which is where we're trying to go when we're using data. We always have that purpose that we're trying to go for. And this is this like key step to make it so much easier for us to accomplish those other steps. So and if we dive down even more, there's sort of two main tasks that we're working on. We're kind of arranging that data into the tables or into that organization structure. And we are actively interacting with that data in that organization structure. Okay, so that's a lot of hand waving. Let's dive into what this actually means. And here is an option. So these might be tables of data that you might see something similar like in your daily lives, right? Okay, so I've got two examples, exact same data. They're just organized in different ways. So example A, we've got our students, We've got the different instruments that we were using and we've got their scores across those. In example B, we have our students, we have the instruments and we have their scores, the percent that they got from each of those. So again, pause the video, I, I encourage you, and just think for a second, when the data are organized in this example A format, what are some questions that come to mind that you can easily answer with the data in this organization? And then similarly do that for example B. So when the data are set up in this way, what are some questions that you can answer or ask of the data that are organized in this way, either by just visually looking at it or by thinking, okay, if I were to put this into Google Sheets or Excel, how would I get it to make a graph to be able to answer my questions, right? Because we visualize our data to help us answer the questions, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so pause. Think about this, what are questions we can ask, example A and example B, and then come on back. So let's think about wide organization. Now that we've thought through those two examples of student data, sorry, I should say, we could also easily fill this in. This is like student scores on instruments, but we could think about this as different trials that different students groups are doing as they're dropping a, you know, a car down a ramp or different plots of the garden where we're counting different numbers of you know bugs that we see things like that so we're talking about students and quizzes instruments and scores but use those to sort of think in your mind of like all the other different kinds of data that we look at okay back to wide organization. So what is this whole thing, wide organization? Well, example A is a kind of wide organization of our data. And we can ask questions like, how did the scores for quiz two differ among students? We can look down for quiz two and we can kind of quickly get a look, visually looking at these numbers and compare them. What is the relationship for quiz one versus test one scores for Raphael? So looking across like this one student, how does this number compare to that number? Super helpful, right? Yeah, so this kind of organization, which is often how our data tables are set up, is good for initial data collection. It's good for when we have a small number of, da of data points, like we did in that example A, to be able to do some number comparisons. And it's really good for post interpretation sharing. So once we've already looked at our data and we've inferred meaning from it, and we're now trying to communicate that meaning out to other people. What it is not as good for is 
doing number comparisons if we have a large number of data points, right? We could look through those test scores for those numbers of students, but if I had quadrupled the number of students and tenfold increased the number of instruments, that would quickly get really hard to do number, some number comparisons across. And it's not very good for just general exploratory data analysis, graphing the data to figure out what's going on. But there are certainly things that this wide organization is good for. I want to call out a few things that are key to this wide organization in terms of how we structure it and organize the data. So the variables are spread out both across columns and within rows. Okay, that's a little tricky. What do I mean by that? So one of our variables is students. So which students? Okay, so that's in our first column here of students. Another variable we have is the instrument, what the students were taking. That is across this row that we have. And then our third variable is their scores on those instruments for each individual students. And that is actually within cells of the combination of an instrument and a student. So we've got a variable of score that is embedded in that cross relationship between two other variables. Okay, nothing's wrong with that for like ease of interpretation right on small data sets that's helpful It indicates the relationship between the two and where those cross over we're getting the value for the third score. The challenge is, is like. Where do we put the units and how do you know that this 59 is actually the score on quiz one for Raphael as opposed to Raphael bought 59 jelly beans to school, right? I mean, you don't know, you can infer from what the other variables are, but you don't actually know what you're looking at within there. So to set up a useful data table, if you've decided to go with this wide organization, again, there are good uses for it. Some key things to call out in terms of how to set it up so it can be most effective as possible when either originally collecting your data or when sharing out the interpretations you've made from your data is to make sure your variables are named and with units as much as possible, usually in those parentheses, for the variables that you can. So ones that are within columns or that are cross rows. And if you can't actually sort of indicate with a, a large scale label, as in like the first cell of a column, then make sure it is very clearly labeled in the legend for the table. You wanna give a sense of the purpose of the columns. What are we actually indicating across the columns? And similarly, what are we indicating across the rows? Because you wanna orient the reader to be able to make sense of the table. You want their mental workings to go towards interpreting and making sense of the data, not to orienting to the organization of the table. Does that make sense, right? So the other thing you want to do is if you include any summary statistics, so if you have a mode, a median, a mean, and then beyond that sort of when we're in more advanced in high school, standard deviation, standard error, any of those types of things, make sure you really call that out, that that is a summary level or that's a, a calculated value from the data, not actually the raw data. So again, readers can clearly know what they're looking at when it comes to the data. And then finally, I've talked about this with that legend, include a descriptive caption that helps a reader sort of orient and get a sense of what they're looking at, and then kind of drives them into what part of this data table, all of this information in a very concise, compact way that is coming at my eyes, what does that mean? What should I pay attention to? Okay, so if that's why, you probably guess that there's a long coming. Well, we also call this tidy organization. So what, what is that? Well, example B is an example of tidy organization. And in fact, it is so long, I couldn't get it all to fit on one slide so that you could actually make meaning of it. And so you might have gathered that there's sort of this as part of it, and then this is the other part of it for, for those data sets that we have. So you can quickly see, yes, it takes up a lot more room. It is a lot longer. But we can ask questions when our data is organized like this of how did the scores for each student change across the units? So we can look sort of across our students and our instruments and our scores. We can get all three of those across the whole data set 
easily graphed up to be able to see see any patterns or look for patterns or what is the relationship between quiz one and test one for all of our students again we can call that in to make a graph for it to look at what that would look like and when we've got it set up so that each of our each of those three variables that we were talking about in this data set our are a column in and of themselves it makes it really easy to tell google sheets or other graphing programs what to look for or what to plot in in the graph so thinking about this sort of this is often how we orient our spreadsheets when we are graphing our data so our digital spreadsheets and things like that this is act like spreadsheet technically is actually the platform that you are using all these words to mean similar things but just sort of think about this as like this long tidy way is really good when you have a lot of data and you want to do number comparisons across all of that data and it's really good for making graphs of the data to be able to look at what are my data showing what is the distribution is it normally distributed therefore can i take an average of the data or is it not normally distributed and therefore I cannot take an average of the data. What are some relationships? What are patterns that I'm starting to see when I pull in different variables to look at? So that exploratory getting a sense of what's going on. What it's not very good at is data collection. And I'll explain why in a moment on the next slide when we talk about how to set up tidy or tidy organization well. It's not very good for helping you do small data set visual number comparisons because there's so many like the data are spread out across so many rows. And it's not very good for post interpretation sharing because it takes up so much space and it's a lot to look at and the readers left with being like what is the takeaway, what are these data actually telling me. So long or tidy organization is that each variable has its own column. So score here is its own column. And then each row is a unique observation. So when we think about that, Raphael took quiz one and got a, nine, got a 59% on that quiz. Then Raphael took quiz two and got a 62%. So those are two different observations of how that student on different instruments, what score they got. So that's what that's what I mean by each row is a unique observation. No other student was Raphael on quiz one and therefore got that score. So each student and each instrument gets its own line because those are unique cases, unique observations of the phenomenon that we're looking at. What's also nice is then when each when each column is a variable, it's really easy to deal with our units and to call them out and to make it clear what these numbers go towards. They're not jelly beans, they're percent score. It's the fact that each case or each observation of the data has a row is what makes it really tricky to initially collect data in this long format because you don't actually know, right? At the beginning of the year, do you know how many quizzes and tests you're going to give? Okay, maybe you're better than I, and you can actually like articulate that on day one, at, you know, coming out of the summer. But for me, it was always sort of a moving target of like, oh, I need, you know, I need a check, extra check for understanding. Okay, I'm going to throw in another quiz just to help the students get a sense of where they're at and where we need to go forward. Maybe in this example, it's a little bit easier to envision how you would do this, but think about the spaces where your students are collecting data in their own investigations in your classroom. Did they know how many trials that they need to do and what they might have and what all the different unique cases are? It's so great. Set it up in the tidy organization to begin with, because that's going to make it easier for them to graph the data and start looking for patterns and making sense of it. If not, no worries. Set it up as a wide organization to collect the data and then convert it to this tidy organization to help them actually explore the data. So tidy data is a term that is used in the data science and data visualization community as a standard way of mapping the meaning of a data set to its structure. So each variable has a column. You can clearly know what the variables are that you are looking at. Each observation or each case is a row and each cell is a single measurement uh, at that observation of every single variable, every single characteristic of the phenomenon that you are that you are looking at. So when it comes to organizing your data to graph it, um, what's helpful here is that 
every row is an observation so that you can just quickly kind of pull in the different data points to make them graph. And this is how our graphing programs expect our data to be organized. So say yes, if you've ever had an, oper on a, an experience where you've got your data beautifully in Google Sheets or Excel or something like that, and then you go to plot it and it puts out this like super strange graph and you sit there and you're like, what the heck? Like, how are these data showing up in this way in the graph? Well, it's because the backend algorithm is expecting the data to be in this tidy organization. And so it doesn't know your data. It doesn't know what you're trying to do with the data. And so there, it's like a misfire. It's like, you know, trains passing in the night. The backend algorithm is making a guess of what, of what you're putting into it, what the input is, but it doesn't actually match your intention. Every, every cell has a corresponding value. So do not merge your rows, do not merge your columns. Every cell for each row in each column should have its own value because that was a unique case, unique observation of the phenomenon. And we've talked about this, every variable has its own column. And so then all the data are there for you to be able to graph and explore in exploratory analysis. So just again, variables, observations, values within each of the cells is what our graphing programs are, ex are, is the way our graphing programs are expecting our data to be organized when, when you are, you know, drag and drop or clicking, asking it to make us graphs. This is the, this is what it's expecting from the data. And this is just sort of a fun way to say that like, once we get our data organized in this tiny format, then that's a standard structure that once you sort of learn what to look for, that you can expect the variable names to be in the first row in the header for every column, then that's a skill you can take to apply to any other tidy organization of a data table. It's a quick way to orient into the data set that you have. But if it's not in this tidy format, then like there's all sorts of ways that it can show up, which means we spend more of our mental time orienting to what's actually in the data and where is it and how is it organized to then figure out how to get it into a graph to interpret it and for meeting and blah, 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 blah. So the, another nice thing is that if one, our graphing programs expect it and two, it makes it easier for our brains to jump into a new data set and make us and make sense of what's there to make decisions on how to explore the data. Okay, a few final things to consider when thinking about organizing data. And we've just like brushed at the surface here, but here are a few other things to think about. So Nathan Yao is a phenomenal data visualizer. He pushes the field of data visualization forward. This is his job. This is like a job that did not exist when I was in college, oh, but so super amazing, known throughout the world. And Nathan says, I spend just as much time getting data in the format that I need as I do putting the visual parts of the graphic together. And when I read this, I stopped in my tracks. And I was like, wow, I never provided opportunity for my students to even consider how we organized our data, let alone to think about how key and fundamental organizing the data is into the format it needs to be to play with it, to make sense, to find those patterns, to make meaning from it. So I just share this as a, it's a key part. People who do this as their daily jobs, making sense of data, spend just as much time on this part as they do on all the other parts. And in fact, that investment of time of getting the data organized for what you are looking for it to do makes things easier. It gives you time down the road because you're not fighting the defaults. You're not fighting the back end algorithm of the graphing programs. If you are taking the time to organize it in a way that will set you up for success in making the graph and exploring those data. Another thought is that, or another comment I want to share is that oftentimes in the K to 12 space, we present our students' data in a sum, in summarized way. So this is the average proportion of leaves eaten. It's a little tricky, right? So this is wide organization. So let me just orient you. So here they've called out the label of each of these are years. Down here is plant type, and within here is the average proportion. So we've we've summarized the data. We have taken an average across hopefully lots of different input data points from the raw data to create this table. Mm -hmm. We want to look at lists of data 
all of the data, that raw data initially, when we are looking to make sense of it. Because how else do we get a sense of what's the variation? How does, how were the native plants in 2011? And how are those different than the native plants in 2012? Right, these averages are quite similar, 0 0.046 and 0 0.037, but they're not exactly the same, right? So we need, we need a sense of all the data to give us that context, that contextual understanding of, I mean, are these different just mathematically or are they in essence the same as the aggregate of the whole? The other thing that I wanna say is that when we are looking at normalized data, when we're looking at a series of rows and columns of our raw data, then that gives that puts the onus on us to make sense of it that gives us the power to be able to get a sense overall in the aggregate of what's going on with our data which is a key piece of figuring out what the patterns are and making meaning of those data so how might this look well in some ways this looks like we don't put lots of things all in one cell right so we don't put numbers and descriptive values in one cell. We don't um, sort of group, you know, uh, merge cells together. And so, yes, it might mean that you have more, um, more columns or more rows in your data set, but that actually gives you more opportunities to explore and ask the questions that you might be wanting to ask of the data. So some takeaways. How you organize your data depends on what you want to find and do with that data. There is no one right way to organize data all the time. We organize data in different ways, depending on are we collecting it? Are we exploring it to make meaning? Are we communicating what inference we've drawn from, from those data? So at different points along the process of working with data, our data is organized in different ways. Typically, a wide data table emphasizes relationships and a tidy long uh, data table database spreadsheet enables exploration of relationships comparing groups and variability so what are you looking for your students to do use that the next time you think about how to organize data and then i want to give a shout out of leverage the tools you have to your advantage whatever graphing program you're using whatever spreadsheet program you are using to make graphs because that's what these are. They're spreadsheet programs that we use to make graphs. You know, it does not matter. Almost all of them have opportunities to find and replace, to fill, to filter, to sort, to create pivot or summary tables out of them. Use this to your advantage. Make sure your students understand kind of why they're doing what they're doing and then get the tool to do it for you so that you can get time to actually explore the data and infer meaning from the data. If you want to explore this a little bit deeply and especially how it relates to sort of what graph types we're using, check out that data, the second data literacy series workshops on creating and iterating data visualizations. Okay, so that was like a whirlwind sort of initial thinkings of what we should be considering when we're organizing data. I encourage you to pause the video, do a little bit of a reflection on what strategies or processes will you use to help your learners organize data based off of this thinking of, oh, it depends, like, what am I trying to do? And that how the data are organized can either assist what you're trying to do, or it can actually put up roadblocks and make it harder for you to accomplish that. And then similarly, sort of kind of along that vein, are there any additional supports that might help you or you, your learners organize data going forward? Feel free to share those out in the comments down below or email me. My email is here. Please reach out. Please contact me. This organizing data piece is so critical because it influences what kinds of graphs we can create easily without it taking tons of time, which then enables us to interpret the pattern, make meaning from the data, draw inferences from it. I hope this was helpful. Let me know, reach out with any questions. As I said, have a great day. Enjoy playing with your data. Thanks.